Okay, thank you everyone for being here. Uh, my name is Alberto Garcia. I'm going to talk about how SteamOS is contributing to the Linux ecosystem. So first I would like to talk a bit about me. Um, I work at Igalia. Uh, the company was founded in 2001, so we're actually coincidentally uh, 22, 22 years old today because this is our birthday. <laughs> um, I'm a free software enthusiast already from since the 90s. I'm a Debian developer for a long time. I'm currently working on SteamOS, and in the past I was working on other projects like QMU, MIMO, WebKit, etc. Um, one of the reasons why I like free software and one of the reasons why I, I'm in this business is that I like how uh, creating a new project contributes to other projects that are maybe related to it. So in the case of uh, uh, some of the projects that I worked in the past and also this one, creating a new consumer device that is running Linux has an effect on, on the open source communities that the, the project is uh, using for the for this hardware. So the one that I'm going to talk about today uh, is the Steam Deck. The Steam Deck, as you as you I'm sure you know, uh, is a handheld gaming computer released by Valve last year. It has a custom operating system called SteamOS. This is version three. Uh, there were two earlier versions of SteamOS, but they they were not for the Steam Deck, and they were they have been discontinued. And uh, I find the Steam Deck interesting because it's a successful consumer device with the standard Linux components. So I want to explore how making a consumer device with the standard Linux components has an effect on the, on the components that the machine is using. So this is what I want to talk about here. I'm going to mention a lot of contributions by different people. Many of them are from my colleagues from Egalia. There's a list of the people that I mentioned here. But I want to add a disclaimer for, before going on. The list of examples that I'm going to have in this presentation is not complete. Uh, there has been contribution by a lot of people. I'm surely that I forgot some important project or some important contribution that uh, I overlooked it or I forgot it, so I apologize in advance. Also, the contributions, although many of them are people from, are from me or for people from my company, there are contributions by different people, companies, and also for regular users who have contributed in the public issue, issue trackers. I try to give credit to everyone in the presentation, but if I overlook someone, uh, or something, please apologize. I apologize in advance. So let's have a closer look at the Steam Deck. The Steam Deck, as, uh, as I said, is a gaming uh, machine. And this is the basic user interface that you, that you get when you start it. This is the, the Steam client browse in the Steam store. From here, you can uh, buy games, you can browse the store, you can browse the discussions, you can play the games, etc. So for the purpose of this uh, presentation, it's maybe not the most interesting part. This is just a regular Steam client in a running in full screen. Uh, but under the hood, this is running a Linux distribution, and it's based on Arch Linux. And it's actually a rather uh, standard Linux distribution. Uh, has a, bit of a few customizations that we uh, uh, we can may see later. But overall, it's a typical Linux distribution with a FHS-like layout. It has a like new user space. It has systemd, dbus, all the usual suspects. So it looks pretty much like your average Linux desktop distribution. And another thing that is interesting that is not so common in, in this kind of uh, consumer devices using Linux is that it's unlocked by default. The user has complete access to the OS. There's nothing hidden. There's nothing from the beginning. You can already uh, have con complete access to the OS. So the Steam Deck has two modes. One of them is the gaming modes, the one that we have seen. Um, from here, you can do basically all the, the essentials. Apart from playing games and buying games, etc. you can configure the network. You can format your SD card. And you can do all the basics. So most users, uh, they don't actually need to leave this, this mode. But in addition to the gaming mode, there's a second mode that is the desktop mode. And this, if, if this looks like a regular KDE Plasma session, it's because that's what it is exactly. So the des desktop mode is a regular KDE Plasma desktop. Uh, you can use it to install anything with it. You can install a web browser. You can install your favorite tools. You can install even non-Steam games. The, the machine doesn't prevent you from installing games that you got somewhere else. Actually, the Steam client itself allows you to run games that are not from Steam. You can add it to the menu and launch them from there. So if you plug a keyboard and a mouse and a display, you can use it like a regular desktop computer. Another interesting thing is that this, this mode is not hidden again. It's not, it's not like the Android developer mode that you have to find a way to, to activate it. This is completely visible in the regular uh, power menu next to the reboot. And anyone can use it. So going back to the main use case of the device, the main use case of the device is, of course, to play games on Linux. So there's a problem when we talk about this thing. Uh, Linux, uh, TMOS is a Linux-based operating system. 
But as you know, most games, uh, most Steam games are for Windows, most games in general are for Windows, and most will never get a Linux version because either the developers are not going, are not going to, to do it or because many of them are so old that are not going to be updated for this. So the solution for this is Proton. Uh, Proton is a tool to run Windows games on Linux. It was developed by, it's actually been developed by Valve. It was published in 2018. And it's a collection of different open source packages. Uh, there's many packages there, but the most important ones are Wine, which is the compa Windows compatibility layer. There's a couple of other uh, uh, projects that translate direct 3D code from Windows into a Vulkan. And then there's also GStreaming and other libraries. As I said, this is one of the big important projects that the, the Steam OS is running and is actively developed. Um, the main component of uh, Proton is Wine. Wine. Wine is used to run Windows applications in Linux. Uh, Wine is not an emulator. The code runs directly on the CPU. There's no emulation going on. So it's basically an implementation of Windows APIs using what's available in Linux, either standard Linux APIs or other standards like Vulkan, etc. Wine is an open source project that is uh, developed by the community, but the, the main driver is uh, the company called Weavers in partnership with Valve. Uh, there are the two, those are the two repositories. Uh, the first one is the official upstream Wine one, and then the other one is the one included in Proton. Proton, uh, I mentioned that it includes several components. All of them are actually modified. They are tailored for the SteamOS, but they contribute the changes back to the upstream projects. So, when we're implementing Windows APIs, um, there's two possible situations. One of them is that the APIs are similar. So in this case, the compatibility layer basically translates the Windows call into a Linux call. And then there's no problem. There's maybe a bit of overhead, but it works fine. But when that, that is not the case, uh, we, why needs to implement the missing parts? And uh, this can result in overhead, depending on the complexity. And this is not always solvable in this space. So one of the tasks that is, uh, people have been doing is uh, figure out what are the APIs that are more uh, difficult to implement, the ones that are have more impact in games, and trying to find if it's possible to add new features to Linux to fill in the missing gaps. I'm going to give a couple of examples. Uh, one of them is the uh, Windows synchronization functions. Uh, Windows has this uh, API called Wait for Multiple Objects that is used by many Windows games, but this doesn't have a uh, direct equivalent in Linux. Uh, it's implemented using, or it was implemented using Futex, but Futex uh, is restricted to a single object, and the Windows API, as the name suggests, can wait for multiple objects at the same time. So doing an implementation based on Futex is slow, and is, uh, it can cause performance problems in, in heavily multi-threaded games. So the solution for this is to develop new APIs, new extend the Futex API to add this functionality. Uh, this, is, this work was done by Andrea Almeida. Futex is a, a fast user space locking uh, syscall. It's used to on, to build other primitives like semaphores and mutexes, etc. It's a very old API and it has grown over the years and it has become hard to use and hard to extend. It has a few limitations. One of them is that it can only wait for a single object, as, as I said before. And the other one is that it only supports 32-bit mutexes. There, it has more limitations, but these are two of the important ones. So when Andre went to talk to the Linux people to, to see what we can do about this. And they say, okay, we cannot really extend the API because the API is already too cluttered. There's several parameters that are overloaded depending on the function that you're using. And this is too, this is too messy, you cannot do this. So we should, how about you write a new Futex2 API where every functionality is uh, separated into a different system call? Uh, so the first part was already done. It was merged in Linux 5.16, which is Futex wav which is more or less the equivalent of the, the Windows API that we are trying to emulate. And then there's more work still in progress to add the rest of the more APIs to the Futex2. Another example, this is uh, very well known. Uh, in Windows, traditionally, file systems uh, are case insensitive. So you cannot have two names, two, two files that uh, the, their names only differ by the case. In Linux, that's not a problem because in Linux file names are just a stream of bytes. So as long as the bytes are different, there's no problem. So the problem is that, uh, of course, Windows applications expect that uh, a file with a, this, two files with the same name, just different by the case, are the same file. So if, uh, if those files are stored in a, in a Linux file system and the Windows program tries to open them and it, they are not found with the original name, the, the application will fail. The solution for this, the slow one, is to implement this in Wine. So if the, when you try to open a file, 
uh, the file is not found with the original uh, with the name that is requested, then you had to go over the path and try to look uh, and try to see if there's a file with the same name, just different in the case. This is of course quite slow. So the solution for this, the faster solution, is to extend the XT4 uh, file system to add uh, support for case sensitive. Uh, this work was done by uh, Gabriel Christman from our friends in Colabora. Uh, it was later added to the F2FS file system by, uh, by Daniel Rosenberg, I think for the Android operating system, if I'm not wrong. And there's many other contributions to the Linux kernel. Uh, for example, reliable user space spin locks. Uh, spin locks are an efficient uh, synchronization mechanism that is used a lot in the kernel, but it's very hard to implement reliably in user space. Uh, there is work going on um, to do this. Uh, there was a presentation this week, uh, two days ago, I think, by Andrea Almeida at this uh, conference. Another one, uh, the SteamOS uses the ButterFS file system. In ButterFS, every file system is uniquely identified by the file system ID. And this has a property that you cannot have two file systems with exactly the same ID. Uh, well, you can actually have them, but you cannot mount them at the same time. But in a situation like uh, what SteamOS does, we have a, a AB partitioning system that we're, I'm going to talk about later. There can be situations which you can actually have the same file system twice, and you need to mount both. And this was not supported, and this was failing. So there was work by Guillermo Piccoli, my colleague from Egalia, to uh, support this scenario. Another one is split lock detector handling. Uh, if you do an atomic operation on non-aligned memory, uh, those are slow and they can use to cause a denial of service. So in order to prevent this, the kernel slows, slows them down uh, so they cannot, uh, they cannot uh, attack the system, basically. The problem is that many games uh, are using this and they are not going to change because many are old games that are not going to be modified. So the solution here was to add a, a knob to the kernel to, to control this behavior. So if the machine is uh, trusted, you can disable this feature and the games can run normally. There's more uh, kernel features by, by Guillerme. Uh, one of them is the refactor of uh, panning fires. There's also a tool to collect data when a, there's a kernel crash, so they can report uh, what went wrong with the system, so it can be uh, debugged and corrected. And there are many other improvements and bug fixes in the kernel that uh, too, too many to list here. So after the kernel, I will talk a bit about graphics. Um, of course, being a gaming machine, uh, graphics is a very important part. Uh, one of the, the key components is RAD-V. This is the Mesa Vulkan driver for AMD GPUs. It's developed by Valve and other contributors, and it's the most popular driver because uh, AMD driver because it's shipped uh, with Mesa. It's open source and it's, it comes with most distros, and it's the one that most people are using. Um, related work is ACO, which is a shaded compiler for AMD graphics. It was also developed by Valve and announced in 2019, and it uh, reduces stuttering and increases uh, FPS in games. Uh, talking about Vulkan, another uh, related work is Vulkan Video. Vulkan Video is a set of extensions for Vulkan for adding uh, hardware accelerated video encoding and decoding. This needs uh, support in the graphics driver itself. Uh, we have work in the Mesa driver by Hajun Koo. But it also needs uh, support in the applications or in the, frame, in the multimedia frameworks in this case. So there's uh, ongoing support to, ongoing work to add support to, to GStreamer. Uh, I think the H264 is already working and there's work to add uh, more codecs. Uh, color. Linux, uh, the DRM subsystem exposes a small set of color properties. Uh, they have been proposed as to extend the API, but uh, none of them have succeeded so far. And in the case of AMD GPUs, they have additional color capabilities. Uh, so there's new work to add driver-specific color API for AMD drivers. Uh, this will allow, among other things, the ability to display uh, content with high dynamic range. This is already supported in user space by the Gamoscope Compositor that I will talk about later. And it's, it will be available in the upcoming SteamOS 3.5, which is actually now in preview, so people can already test it. This is a uh, work done by Melissa Wen, Joshua Aston, and Harry Bendler. More work by Andrea Almeida. This is better handling of GPU resets. Uh, GPUs, as you know, are very complex, and shaders are also very complex and can crash. Uh, so the kernel's job is to, when there's a problem, they have to report the problem to user space. The problem is that there's no standard API to do that. So the, the roadmap of this work is to standardize how DRM reports GPU hangs, GPU hangs to user space, standardize how user space drivers deal with the hang, and what compositors do after a reset. Uh, this work is, uh, as I said, is work in progress by Andre. 
uh, it was presented this year at the North American Open Source Summit. Marwar by Andrea is uh, adding uh, a synchronous page flip into the Atomic API in the RAM. And then there's Game Scope. Game Scope, this is user space, uh, a user space project. This is a, a microcompositor for games. The idea is that this works with the case where a game tries to use a resolution that is different from the native resolution of the display. So instead of changing resolutions every time for every game, uh, Gamescope tricks the game into thinking that it's running in the resolution that the game requested, and then Gamescope uh, scales the, 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 the content to fill the screen. So this way the games can request any resolution, they will think that they are using that resolution, and the, the, the content will be displayed in full screen without having to change the video mode every time. There's also another feature that is frame rate limiting. You can uh, make the game uh, reduce the, the frame rate. This can be used, for example, to reduce the battery usage. Game scope is what runs the Steam Deck game UI, the one that I showed at the beginning. So that's why all games are running with this. And this is, a, as I said, this is a standalone project. This, is, this can be installed in a, in a normal distro. It's actually available, in, in, I think, in most of them. And you can use it. I was trying it to run GTK application on full screen, and it just works. And apart from graphics and kernel, there's, of course, the general OS work. Uh, part of this, a big part of this, is the regular work that is uh, maintaining a distro. So it's making sure that all components work together, that all versions, they interact with each other properly, working in the OS update system, working on the boot process, many other things. But there are some parts that are interesting and are uh, interesting for the community overall. Uh, this is the part that I'm working on. Uh, SteamOS, as I said, is uh, Arch Linux uh, with a customization layer on top. Almost all packages are unmodified. They come directly from March. Uh, they are not even revealed, so they are the same binaries. And the philosophy, uh, the philosophy of Arch, Arch Linux in general is to keep everything as close to upstream as possible. They try to not to apply downstream patches unless it's really necessary. And in the case of SteamOS, it's the same. The, uh, having a downstream fork of the packages is something that is just adds more overhead and it's not interesting for anyone. So when there's a problem, when something needs to be fixed, it's fixed directly upstream uh, to the original developer or to the arts if it's appropriate. Uh, one difference between a regular arts uh, installation and SteamOS is that SteamOS is immutable. So the root file system is read only. Uh, SteamOS has an AB partitioning scheme, and this means that there's two copies of the root file system. One of them is the active one, that is the one that you are using when you're using the device, and the other one is not active. So when you try to do an OS update, the OS, OS is downloaded into the inactive partition. If everything goes, goes fine, then you change the switch in the boot uh, configuration and you boot into the other partition. So uh, if the download is interrupted, there's no problem. You, you can still uh, keep using the, the original uh, version of the file system. And if you reboot into the new one and there's problems, there's uh, some uh, critical bug or something, you can still go back to the previous one. So the thing is that since users are not expected to use the package manager or to, to touch the, the, the root file system, how do you install new software there? I mean, you can do that because the, the, you have full access to the operating system, so you can make the root file system read-write and install your things there. But after an uh, OS update, they will be lost. So what's the way to, to install new software? Here there's two types. One of them is, of course, Steam games. Those just uh, install directly from the store, so you don't need to... Steam takes care of everything. And the other one is the actual the, the normal desktop apps, and those are installed. Uh, the recommended way to install them is using Flatpak. Flatpak is a technology that has been in the in the world for many years. Uh, it's quite stable now, and this idea of installing everything using Flatpak and having the the root file system read only uh, is also using other distributions like Silverblue or Endless OS. <coughs> Flatpak is two things at the same time. Flatpak is a, uh, it's an app framework for the Linux desktop, but it works as a sort of a packaging system, a way to distribute applications that are independent from the distribution. So the same application can be installed anywhere. And it's also a, a way to isolate applications from the host. So it gives a layer of, uh, of uh, it's sort of a containerization uh, tool that adds a layer of security that can be adjusted depending on the tool. And it also allows uh, applications to be handled directly by their developers. Um, in the case of uh, traditional Linux model, typically the upstream developer publishes a source tarball, and it's the, each distribution has to build a tarball and distribute the binaries. In the case of Flatpak, the developers themselves, they can directly uh, produce their binaries and, and put them for everyone. 
the package self is just a technology the you can create a repository where to where to, to put those applications but the most common one and the one that uh, is let, let's say the official one of sorts is Flathub, which is uh, the linux app store at the moment it has more than 2000 applications available and is the primary distribution channel for some applications uh, i mentioned here the example of bottles uh, because they they published a, a note i think a couple of years ago saying that asking people to please use the the flat pack application the flat pack version of bottles when, when running this application because that's the only supported one i think along with the arch one uh, otherwise people would be using the build of bottles uh, by some distribution that is maybe not using the right version of each library so there would be uh, errors and they are easier to more uh, difficult to debug so as part of uh, since flat, flat pack is the primary um, um, tool to install applications in steam os there's part of the work that is uh, keeping flat pack alive and, and, and correcting it and adding new features that is done by some of the, the steam os developers but there's also another interesting uh, aspect of that and for this i'm using this meme that i saw the other day in, in mastodon by cassidy james from endless and is that by making flat pack the primary uh distribution channel for for the desktop mode of steam os uh, application developers that want to uh, publish applications for the Steam Deck, they are indirectly supporting the Linux desktop. So they are every application that people want to develop for the Steam Deck because it's the Steam Deck, because it's a gaming device, not because they are necessarily interested in Linux. They are still uh, indirectly supporting the Linux desktop and all the work that is uh, going on to uh, add new features, uh, fix bugs, uh, improvements, etc. is benefiting the Linux desktop overall. In Flagpack, one of the uh, key components, are, the key concept is the portals. Uh, since applications are isolated from the host, portals pr uh, um, provide a way to, for applications to interact with the host. Portals are used by Flatpak, but they are independent from Flatpak, so they can be used by others. Um, portals, uh, they define a set of debug interfaces for things like opening files, uh, taking screenshots, uh, printing, opening the settings, etc. The portal themselves, they, they find APIs, but then they are implemented by different backends that are specific to each desktop. So you, if you open a file, you get the file picker from your desktop of choice. So there's the KD backend, the GTK backend, the WL roots backend, the GNOME backend, etc. The problem is that, of course, there's a lot of different desktop environments. Some of them are custom ones. And not all backends work on all desktop environments. Some of them, they don't, they work maybe, but they don't look nicely because they don't integrate well with the desktop. And some of them they don't work at all so they can cause this can cause crashes timeouts and other issues the backend developers they cannot possibly uh testing all desktop environment so uh the situation here is that since many backends can be installed at the same time how do you choose which one to use uh the problem is that there's a way to to select what uh, portal backend you want, want to use but there's the existing mechanism is very limited and in this affects the steam deck the steam deck runs two graphical sessions uh the the gaming one and the desktop one and both of them may need at some at some points to use uh, portals so selecting the right one uh, or the one which ones to use and which one not to use is very important so this was uh fixed uh this year by emmanuel Evasi. um there's a new mechanism to configure portals and with this desktops can select uh, had a much more um elaborate method to, to select which portals to use and which portal not to use this was just added to the new version of uh, free desktop portal 118 that was released i think last sunday and it will be soon in all major districts apart from all the working portals there's a lot, a lot of also many bug fixes in different components of the os and here's some examples with the kde we have been doing fixes in uh, the the discover the application to install software um also rate flat pack related fixes and uh, fixes related to external drives and also be working in disks, which is the storage daemon uh, used to well to manage different devices and many more there's been also fixed in network managing also in pipewire sdl and many many others uh, by different people so wrapping up um steam as, as i said is a fairly standard linux system so it's as close to your regular des desktop uh, uh, as it gets has the philosophy to keep everything upstream so every improvement every change that is made goes directly into the linux depths that we all use in order to make steam os or steam deck a successful gaming device there has been a lot of work to 
Linux kernel to the graphics and to the desktop, and that is pretty much everything is open source and, and can be used by all of you, all, all, all of us. And then for uh, people who are not, not necessarily Linux users themselves, uh, this brings a new way to a new way to, to to bring those people closer to Linux. As I said, app developers now have an incentive to um, publish apps in, in Linux thanks to this, even if they are not Linux users themselves. And with this, I finish the presentation. I would like to thank you for being here. If you like this kind of technologies and uh, working on these kind of things, I would like, like to let you know that we're hiring, so this is our website. And this is all. <laughs> If anyone have questions, I will be happy to answer. Yes, uh, it's basically uh, it's a snapshot of uh, uh, Arch Linux uh, with some customization on top. The customizations are basically the minimum necessary to integrate with the Steam client and with the two sessions, etc. So there's not, um, as I said, we keep them to the minimum. So the problems that affect, are, uh, like the question is whether the problems that affect Arch Linux uh, will also affect this, uh, the Steam OS. Yeah. Like usually, uh, we don't have the same versions of the packages because Arch Linux is a rolling release, and, and SteamOS takes a snapshot and, and stays with it for a while. Like SteamOS 3.5 has a certain set of packages, and they are not updated unless there's a problem with them. Oh, it depends on the pace of the, of the update. I think the 3.4 was released, uh, I don't remember, earlier this year, and 3.5 is in preview now. So it depends. I don't think there's a... Uh, I'm not the one to talk about this. I don't think there, I think there's a fixed schedule. I think things are published when they are ready. Yeah. So the question is if it's possible to root the root file system the way, same way that you do it with Android. You have complete access. You open a terminal. You can sudo into root. And you, there's a script to make the SteamOS, uh, the root file system read, read write. It's provided by, by the system. It's uh, like a support tool. You are not encouraged to do that because you are on your own. If you do that and you start to install things, then you can break things. But people do it. People, uh, they want to have the, I don't know, the coops server to print things. They do it. Um, well, that's why there, um, I would like to mention, um, the recommended way to, to install applications is Flatpak. Flatpak is only for desktop applications, but there's also other tools to install applications that are more for terminal, command line, etc. Uh, that I didn't cover here. But they are not officially supported yet, but there are people experimenting with containers and with NICs and things like that. So the question is if uh, Arch is a rolling release, so every time there's a regression of a problem, the Arch package is updated. But SteamOS takes snapshots, so how do we do that? If there's, we detect that there's a problem with one of the packages. Well, if there's a problem with one of the packages, it's really a problem that deserves uh, an update, then we update it downstream. We, if it's something that hasn't been fixed upstream yet, then we send the fix there. We keep the, the, the patch private, and then on the next rebase, uh, the patch is not necessary anymore. The rebase doesn't, doesn't happen. The rebase happen regularly because there's a sort of development. There's a, a um, update channel that is sort of like a nightly build. It's not called like that. That is, uh, that is a bit more hidden from the user, but users can actually download them, but it's on their own risk because they are basically not tested. So you can lose your data. And those, uh, in that channel, the, the Arch, Arch is rebased every once in a while. So every, one, every time like we feel like, okay, we should rebase the system because the, 
we're having a bit of two older version of uh, Pipewire or Network Manager or something. So. More questions? Yeah. So the question is, uh, wasn't SteamOS Debian-based before? Yes, the earliest version of SteamOS were Debian-based. Uh, the one for the Steam Deck is SteamOS 3 only, and that one is based on Arch. Yeah. That, what, that happened already several years ago. So the question is, why did it change from Debian to Arch? No, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a, as a Debian user myself, I'm a, Suppose I was a, bit, a little bit disappointed, but I, it's okay. It's, uh, I mean, the nice thing about Arch is that, uh, as I said, like they uh, they try to be as close to, to upstream as possible. So everything that is uh, fixed there, it goes upstream quickly. More questions? Yes. Yeah, I guess there's new features that are on the works, but I don't know if, how much I can take about, talk about those. In the, if you check the the, the, the change log of the new 3.5 version, that you will see some of the new features. Um, one of the things that are going to be new now is the ability to to, add, to connect regular USB external USB drives, and the having of we're having a bit of issues with those. Like there's some rough edges that need to be to de dealt with, but. That's everyday work. Yes? How many more upstream changes are on the kernel or on the system? I'm sorry, can you repeat? Uh, how many more upstream changes are applied on the system? Like a few or like there are still some? I didn't get the part. How? How many? Uh, uh, how many? How many? How many downstream patches we have on the kernel? Uh, on the kernel, actually, don't know. I suspect, I suspect more than in other packages. But uh, um, I think now we are using the LTS version of the kernel, if I'm not wrong. I think it was not the case for previous versions of TMOS. Is the, the less stable one now? Okay, it's not LTS. No, the long term was the no. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So the question is, if you go from one version of the like, Steam OS has several channels. There's the stable channel. There's the beta channel, etc. If you go from one to the other, how do you? Keep compatibility, how you manage that uh, going back to a previous version doesn't break compatibility, etc. Okay, so the root file system is read only, and that's where all the packages are. There's another file system that is the var, var partition. That one is read write, and that's where the, there's basically an overlay, etc overlay that is stored there, and that's where your etc changes are there, uh, the state of some packages are there, etc. So as part of the update system that downloads a, a new operating system and switches to the new one, there's a tool that um, copies your configuration into the uh, configuration of the other uh, of the other partition, and there's some tweaking going on. Sometimes, in the cases that we know that there's a feature that doesn't will not work with the other version of the system, then we, we update it manually or we update it automatically. Sorry, uh, this can, of course, this is uh, not without challenges because there's a lot of possible packages that people can have. Especially if people install their own software, you can have a lot of things in etc and. The good thing is that you can actually wipe the var partition. The system will reboot sort of in a, in a uh, original state. However, you, you still keep all your games. You still keep, I think, the Flatpak application should work because those are stored in the home partition. So doing a reset of the var partition should, uh, should remove those compatibility problems and should still leave you with a system where you still have your games. More? Okay, so if there's no more, I think we're done. Thank you. Thank you.